Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me. We're here today to talk about explaining learning differences to kids, talking directly to our learners about their amazing neurodivergent brains. So my name is Liz Engoff. I am an educational psychologist in the Bay Area, California. And I um, was a school psychologist for eight years with a big district and then transitioned into private practice where I now focus on assessment and really helping kids and their parents understand what is unique about their amazing braids. So as we get started, I want you to think about a kid, a specific child that you would like to have this conversation with. And imagine sitting down with them, looking at them and starting to explain, this is what is unique about your brain. What do you think will be tricky about that? What do you predict will be the hardest part? Go ahead and write it down for yourself. And I guarantee you, whatever you wrote down, you are not alone. When I first started talking to kids about their testing results, I mean, it seemed like such a natural extension of our practice. We're taught how to present results at meetings and we're taught how to talk to parents. But the first couple of times that I sat down with kids, it was surprisingly challenging. And in one specific instance, the parents of one of my first, actually my first private practice assessment, the parents said, you know, why don't we take some time to actually talk to our child and you can explain all this to him. And he, um, you know, he set it up, got all the right metaphors, that positive language and talked about traffic jams and uh, whatever I had found. And he just put his head down on the table and started to cry. And then he ran out of the room. I thought we need to do better. What in the world happened? I did all of the things. And so I started talking to a lot of other um, psychologists actually all over the world. And it turns out that the challenges that we have in talking to kids are pretty similar. The first one is just the language that we use. We are taught to find pathology and difficulty and disorder. But when we turn around to talk to kids, we want positive, empowering language. So how do we find language that is really going to validate the things that are hard in a positive and empowering way. It's also developmentally appropriate. And then of course, attention spans. There's a lot to explain and kids, the kids, kids in general just have short attention spans. And then the kids that we work with, often their attention span is even further impacted. And of course, overwhelm. It's just so much to hear about yourself. And this may be the first time that they're ever hearing about dyslexia, never mind that it's something that affects them. Um, the time to put these things together. So as school psychologists, we are assessing and then having a meeting and moving on. And this time is not built into our schedule. And even for people who do have the counseling time or um, more of a, a luxury of, of private practice and being able to set their own hours, um, it takes so much time to put together a presentation for a kid or like the different report or a PowerPoint. Um, and we're just, we're not paid for those, those hours. Um, and it takes, it takes a lot to put together. Um, and then the last thing that comes up often is parents. And the reason that this comes up is because a lot of parents are really scared to talk to their kids about things that are different about them. They're afraid that their self-esteem is going to be impacted. And it, I don't know why it took me 15 years of practice to realize that quite often our parents are related to our children. So the, whatever we are working with our kids on, chances are parents have gone through something really similar. And they went through it in a time when we were not talking about neurodiversity affirming perspectives, when we were not supporting kids. Special ed looked really, really different a couple decades ago. And so parents are carrying a lot of trauma and triggers that are brought up as soon as we turn to think about, you know, 
talking to their kids. Um, and they're learning about their kids' profile for the very first time too. So whatever processing they need to do, they need that space. So we're working with all of these factors. And so it begs the question, why are we doing this? Why not wait until the child is older, has better language, a longer attention span, maybe more experience with life, more perspective? Well, the truth is that we kids know something is different. And we all have seen this. And the kids that we work with, they know that something is awry. They just don't know why. And when they don't know why, they start to develop their own narratives about why things are hard. And these narratives are um, often super negative and really, really harmful. And we've all experienced this in our practice, but it's actually starting to come out in the research when we talk to adults who are diagnosed later in life and ask them about their early experience. They, the adults in their life might have thought that they were protected from this knowledge, but they knew something was different. And these are the things that they thought were actually going on. So when we talk to kids about their differences early and often, we are helping them to shift their self-narrative from some version of I'm broken to I'm built differently. And not only am I built differently, but it's pretty awesome the way that my brain is built. And so we're taking assessment from what it traditionally is, which is an identification process to an empowerment process for our children. All right, are you ready to figure out how? <laughs> so I'll just touch briefly on some of the research that's behind this. I, a lot of my practice is firmly rooted in Ross Green's collaborative proactive solutions. Um, and the thing that I love about this model is because it is a very specific, concrete, laid out way to talk to kids about hard things, to talk to kids about the things that are challenging for them in a way that is super respectful and, and validating. So you'll hear, if you're familiar with Ross Green's work, you'll hear a lot of that in what I present today. Of course, when we're trying to understand kids' experience, using a process approach to assessment and is gonna really help us unpack what's actually going on when um, kids are trying out a task. So you'll hear pieces of that. You're gonna hear a lot of growth mindset language. And then, um, Therapeutic assessment is a branch of clinical assessment that is looking at or is, is using assess, the assessment process as a therapeutic process. Um, and the uh, creator, Dr. Steve Finn, talks a lot about getting up onto the observation deck with the, the patient, often an adult, although this has been applied to children as well and trying to look down on what's going on with them in collaboration. And so all of these things have come together to uh, create the brain building framework. And um, on the, the handouts page that I will um, direct you to, uh, there is actually a list of references if you wanna go deeper into any of these. But the sum total of where all these things intersect is that our assessment tools are gonna to be most effective when we understand the results within the context of the child's lived experience. Because this is what neurodiversity affirming assessment is really about. This is its core, understanding the child's lived experience. But our assessment tools don't do that on their own. To do that, we have to talk to the child. And the talk today is about how we talk to the child about what's going on. Uh, we're going to go through four different pieces of this framework today, um, and I am hoping that you will um, play along at home by writing some things down as I give you the prompts so that you can create a profile for the child that you just were thinking about uh, and to really leave with a uh, plan for how could I sit down with this child? How can I sit down and have that conversation with them? Or what would it look like integrated into my work with that child? I'm gonna introduce a lot of tools to you today. 
Most of them are available for free on the website. Uh, brainbuildingbook.com slash NASP is where you're going to find everything that I talk about today. And my disclosures, the only thing that is um, not free on the website are the brain building books. And um, I am the author and publisher of these books. And they are workbooks that you customize and individualize with the, the child as you're going through the assessment process. So they have something to take home with them to share with teachers, to share with parents. That's just all about their brain and what you learn together during the assessment process. So let's dive into part one. Feedback starts before intake. What in the world does this mean? <laughs> so um, in the feedback literature that is available, how to, how to present results um, often to parents or to adult patients, they talk about that feedback actually starts at intake. And what that means is that during the intake interview, you are planting seeds for where you might be going so that um, when parents come in uh, with a question and you're kind of wondering, I don't know if they're going to qualify or not, you're starting to have the question right away of what would it mean if we could answer your questions but your child didn't qualify? Or what would it mean if, um, you know, that it turns out that your child's having, we have different reasons for why your child's struggling with attention. Um, and it's not ADHD. Or um, a child comes in for one referral question, but you start to wonder about another possible explanation. Um, and so recently for me, this happened that a child came in, um, the parents were wondering about ADHD and I started to hear some of the markers for autism. And so at that intake session, to start to plant the seed, this is where we might be going, what does that feel like for you? What do you know about autism? What would it be like if we ended up in a different place? So that when you get to the feedback session, there are no surprises. But then I realized that for kids, um, the first time that they hear about an assessment is actually not with us. It's, how it's when their parents tell them, you're gonna go work with this person or when their teacher says, hey, you know, Dr. Liz is gonna come take you for a little bit today. And so how adults talk to kids about the assessment process matters. This is a handout that I developed that is designed to give some um, parents and educators some a script um, for how to introduce the concept of testing so that we're setting kids up as collaborators, identifying a problem that the child wants to solve so that they can get really invested and being transparent about what is this process. If we tell kids, you're going to play a bunch of games with the psychologist, then at the other end of the assessment, um, we're not set up to actually talk to them about what we found out. Also, they figure out really quickly that these games are not fun <laughs> all the time. So this um, kind of helps give a script. And it is, um, when, you, when you access it, you'll see that it's a Google Doc. So you can actually change it to fit um, the language that you want to give to parents and teachers and how you want to explain it. It's also available in Spanish, graciously um, translated by some of our colleagues in Mexico. Um, and so um, you have that available to you as well. Here's what it sounds like. I noticed you're working really hard at math this year, but it still seems pretty tough and I'm not sure why. I'm thinking if we knew more about how you learn best, we could do a better job helping you. So what's gonna happen is that Dr. Liz will do different activities to figure out how you learn um, and why things are hard right now. So we are going to definitely make sure that we're mentioning that we are gonna talk about some hard things. And if something's tricky, I want you to let Dr. Liz know so you can work together to figure out why. This is gonna be collaborative. Um, so what is, what's the problem? This is that second part about identifying a problem the child wants to solve. This is also kind of before you're really working with the child, talking to parents or even talking to the child about what, what do you want to learn from this assessment? So right now we're going to talk about kind of how we start to formulate what the child's question might be later since a lot of kids do not come in with a question or they'll just say nothing's wrong i'm fine about how we start to pull those questions out of them 
through the assessment process. But first, let's just do a little translation activity because the way that adults talk about problems is different than the way children talk about problems. Uh, for instance, so, um, the referral question, if you think, so you know what, before we do this, think about what the referral question was for your kid. Why did the kid that you wrote down come in for an evaluation? Why are they being assessed for special education? Um, what was the adult concern? This might be can't pay attention, can't read, behavior. Like, what was the thing? Now we're going to translate it because when adults say they can't pay attention, kids might say, I can't pay attention. But usually they have a different perspective on what's going on. They might say things like, it's so boring, or the, all the other kids are distracting me. Same thing, teachers love this referral question. I think there's a processing problem. What does that even mean? Well, for kids, that might mean, I hate school. School is awful. Or just that the subject is so confusing. We as adults talk about executive functioning skills, but kids will talk about just too many things on their plate or not being able to find anything. Um, we might talk about poor working memory. Kids will talk about forgetting stuff or just that there are too many steps in a problem. We complain about kids rushing through things, but their perspective might be that we're asking them to do something that takes way too long. And then of course, I love this one. We <laughs> might say that um, kids are procrastinating. They leave things to the last minute, but what did kids say? I do it just in time. That is not a problem for me, but my parents are always nagging me about it. That is a problem for me. So these are the problems that we are solving for kids. We're solving the boring problem, the distraction problem, the I hate school problem, the confusing math problem. We're solving the parents nagging me problem or teachers on my case problem. That's why we're here. I, I notice that you're having difficulty with teachers. You've been saying that the teachers are nagging you. I notice you've been having trouble with math. We're here to figure out why. It feels like there's something we're missing because your teachers have tried a bunch of stuff. This nagging thing is not working. We need to understand something else. And so that's my job is to be a detective and understand. And so in finding a problem the child wants to solve, we are giving purpose to the assessment. It is a signal of respect to the child. You are the one doing all the work. You're the one that's here. And I want to know what's important to you. It's going to help us understand what's most important to the child because the questions that they ask reflect what's most important. I'll present a kid in a little bit that want, you know, the questions are about writing and academics and his questions are about how do I control my anger? And so we know, oh, that's the piece that we want to focus on for him. Um, it's going to help us frame any supports that they're going to receive. So if they're going to get, um, if they are going to get resource support, for example, we can say, you know how we were trying to solve the boring problem? You're going to be working with this, um, this specialist because we want to figure out ways to make it more interesting and engaging for you. Um, and then it's going to give adults a common language to talk about things. So that's the first part. And because time is such a big issue, I want you to really take away from this workshop some little nuggets that you can integrate in your practice. So maybe just sending home that uh, handout at the beginning of an assessment is your nugget that you're going to take away and integrate into your practice. Maybe just trying to reframe the assessment question in kid words so that you have something to tell the kid when they come in, like, hey, your teacher's been saying you've been complaining, things are so boring. We're gonna solve that problem today. Whatever, um, so, so those are, are two, two things that you might be able to take home today to integrate into your practice, that it's gonna shift the way that kids engage with the process. So the second set of little take home nuggets that I have for you are about building a shared language. And it starts with talking about the brain and being super transparent about why we're here. We are going to be doing two things to give kids some language because 
so often kids don't come in for the language with the language. I mean, for a lot of kids will say like, what do you want to know more about? What's, what's your problem? And you know, I don't know. <laughs> um, so we need to give them something to work off of. So we're going to introduce the assessment process by teaching a little bit about the brain. So they have a way to ask about it. And then introducing a construction metaphor that will that they can build off of um, because it's a really easy way to start talking about things in that growth mindset way throughout the assessment. And then we're going to be getting language from them. And I'm going to introduce some strategies for helping kids ask their own assessment questions and reflecting with the child to understand their experience. So let's teach some brain language. Um, when I introduce assessment, I introduce it using the brain. Here's what we're doing today. We are understanding your brain. The brain is made up of many different parts, each with a different name and a different job. Here, what are some of the things that you like to do? And let's talk about how your brain helps you to do those things. So this is my way, instead of just like, oh, tell me about yourself. What do you like to do? We're actually using their strengths to introduce the assessment process. And so Joe loves rock climbing. And the first experience that she had with me is that she was able to be an expert in rock climbing and teach me all about it. And then we mapped it on to her brain. How does your brain do this? All these parts are going to work together to help you do different things. Um, so let's think about like, what do you have to see when you're rock climbing? Uh, how do you use your balance and coordination? Um, how do you use your, like what you hear? Oh, you have a partner you have to communicate with. Oh, that's super cool. Okay. And then what about attention and decisions? Do you have to pay attention? Yes, you have to pay attention or else you might fall or and you have to know when to relax on the wall. Apparently, that's a big thing for Joe when she's rock climbing. Just to like be aware enough to take a deep breath. And then being able to visualize her route as she looks up to see like, okay, how am I going to get there? So we've just established that she uses her whole brain all the time to do the things that she loves. Guess what? No broken part of her brain. Going into the assessment, now intrigued about how this works. I've gotten some expertise information about Joe, and she knows that we're not here to find out what's broken because obviously her brain is doing exactly what it needs to do. Here's another example. This is the image that I use for older kids. Alex is a middle schooler. He loves playing Minecraft. So if you um, have uh, worked with any child within the last couple of years, you have talked a lot about Minecraft. Um, and we can talk about all the different things. Minecraft involves building, it involves communicating with um, different kids. It involves coordination of the, the motor piece of the, the keyboard. Um, oh, sorry, the mouse and the keyboard. Um, you obviously have to look at things. You have to notice details. You have to decide what to build and where to build it. And you have to collaborate with other, other people. You are using your whole brain to play Minecraft, apparently. Um, and for a lot of kids, we also talk about the emotional brain and the limbic system. And for kids who struggle with sensory overwhelm, this is a really good one because we can talk about how our sensory uh, filters are very geographically close to our emotional centers. So when we're overwhelmed by sensory information, we're often overwhelmed emotionally. And these things tie together. And so just getting kids curious about the brain, introducing this piece can really set us up for a good conversation about um, sensory processing, emotional processing later on. And you can see here, I wrote down a lot of things that reflect our conversation. So we'll remember it later. Um, and, you know, I told Caleb, we're going to be working on memory, for example, and we're going to do lots of different, different tasks to look at how you remember things. And he's like, he's, he came up with a whole theory of memory, which is this whole other thing about short-term, middle-term, long-term and traveling memory. And I just got very curious, like, tell me more about that. How does that work for your brain? I haven't heard that theory before. Um, but something really important that came out of this discussion is he said that his memory is great for memorizing scripts, but he doesn't like that his memory is so good at um, remembering when somebody hurt him or somebody else because he can't forget it. And then he goes to school with these grudges. And so we started to really talk about the emotional experience that Caleb was having at school. So now we've just talked about how awesome our kids' brains are. 
and then we can say that, okay, I'm going to bring out a bunch of activities. Everything we're going to do is just going to make your brain work in different ways. Some things um, are going to be hard and some are going to be easy. So you just do your best. And if something feels easy or fun, challenging or frustrating, let me know. I want to invite you to tell me about your experience. I'm going to ask you about it too, but I just want to make sure that that invitation is very, very clear even before we get started. So the second piece of giving them some language is the construction metaphor. So this is the brain building metaphor. Your brain works by sending messages from one part to another using special cells called neurons. Neurons connect to each other, making pathways in your brain like billions of tiny roads. So when oops, um, some things are gonna be easy for your brain and we can think of those as your highways. So as we're working together, and this might be before you start, like part of your interview, um, if you're asking what they like to do, um, tell me more things you like to do, which classes you like the best, where do you feel your strengths are, or as we're kind of going through the testing and something comes out as a real strength and they really enjoyed a certain task that we do or reminds them of something they're really good at, we can be documenting those things throughout our testing sessions as we discover their highways. So this um, may sound something like, um, this was for, for Joe, remembering stories and experiences, um, noticing how creative she is, um, making people laugh was a big one, and jumping into new things. So, oh, your parents said that, that you like, recently went on a field trip and you were the first one in line and like really excited to do this new thing. Um, or, you know, a kid is coming in for attention issues, you know, as we're talking through things like, oh, it sounds like your attention actually works really well when you like something. So let's write that down on your highways that you actually focus well on things that you enjoy. Cause that's going to help with that affirming language later on, when we talk about how hard it can be to turn on attention for the things that are not so interesting. So go ahead for your kid, the kid that you have in mind, and write down some of their highways and try and write it down in a way that the kid would recognize and agree with. So using that kid language, doing that quick translation in your head. So if it's visual processing skills, you might say like building or noticing details, um, things that they would connect with. Write a quick list of some of the highways for the kid that you have in mind. We're gonna use that information later. Um, you, we also all have construction zones or construction projects that we're working on. These are the skills that you are building. And for kids, I used to go right into like, okay, so what's hard? But so many kids, especially elementary school students, as soon as we said what's hard, it's almost like we, throughout everything that we had just talked about, about how awesome they are and their strengths, because suddenly there was a lot of anxiety that we were gonna find something wrong with them. So um, I started putting in this interim, this kind of transition question, which was um, that, you know, you, you've already um, uh, done some construction. So if you remember, First, when you were little, it was hard to what? It was hard to walk. A lot of kids have uh, younger siblings and they're watching them walk. Like one time you couldn't walk and then your brain had to make new roads and then now you can walk. Maybe swimming, riding a bike, uh, reading. Anything that used to be hard that's not hard anymore. So we're proving to them like, oh, look, you've done this before. The construction projects we're about to talk about, you've done it before, you can do it again. Um, and it totally changed the next conversation. So, you know, Joe had trouble waiting to share her ideas. She used to call out impulsively. Now she has more control and she'll raise her hand and she was really proud of that. Um, but when I asked, okay, what are you working on next? Because sometimes you doesn't, your brain's not making it easy and it can be really frustrating. And she's like writing at the speed of my ideas is really hard. So writing really fast. 
Okay, so that's the next project that we're going to work on. And just like you did the, you were able to do the other project, you can do this. So go ahead and just take a minute to write down some of the construction projects that your child might be working on. Um, and one tip for later um, talking to kids about this is thinking about like the top two or three things that they might be working on. And your list here should be shorter than your highways when you're, um, when you're making that list. But what's the biggest thing that they're working on right now? So now we get to get some language from kids. Now, as I said before, some kids come in with an assessment question, but some kids do not. So here are Joe's um, parents' questions. Why does she hate writing? And why is it hard for her to pay attention? Joe's question, why am I so good at rock climbing? We needed to go, this is a great question. This is a great question because we can focus on her strength. She had a lot of visual spatial strength. We can talk about how that maps on to being able to see her root and some of like the physical things that she enjoys. She um, really likes personal challenges, does not like competition. And so rock climbing is a great sport for her. Um, this is a great question, but I wanted to pull a little bit more and see if we could figure out if there's a problem that she recognizes that's related to writing since, and, and attention since that's what was on her parents' mind. Um, so uh, Alex from Minecraft, um, the, his questions were, why is it difficult? Um, parents' questions were, why is it difficult for Alex to control his behavior? Why does he struggle socially? Does he have ADHD? And then Alex informed me partway through the assessment, by the way, Dr. Liz, I just want to let you know, I don't have ADHD. No way, not even close. Hmm, this was going to be very tricky. He to talk to him later about ADHD that he's very convinced he does not have. So um, here's some of the ways that I help kids ask assessment questions. The first is just brain questions. After we've talked about the brain, introduced assessment, do you have any questions about the brain in general? Is there anything you're curious about? or your brain specifically. I love compare and contrast questions because kids will often tell me the, for instance, a class that they like and a class that they hate. So I wonder why you like this class and don't like that class. Can we ask that question? You said you love to read, but you hate to write. Maybe a good question is why do I love to read and hate to write? Um, we can also, a lot of times in our social emotional interview, we'll ask about three wishes, or I like to ask the magic wand question, what's something you would change in your life right now? And sometimes that can lead to a really good question. What can we do to help do that? I would get rid of all homework. Okay, it sounds like homework's tricky for you. I wonder if a question would be like, how can we make homework more tolerable? And of course, you know, it's not hard, it's just boring. I'm just bad at it. I was just built that way. Um, all right, I wonder if it would help to ask what could help it be not so boring. Cause that just ugh, breaks my heart that you are so bored all time, all the day, all the time, all the days. Um, or I wonder if we could just make it not so hard. I'm not promising a magic solution because I know that you don't think that's possible. But what if we could just move the dial a couple of notches? Maybe that's a question we can ask. So going through this process, we got a couple more questions out of Joe by the end of the assessment process. And so she said um, that writing was hard because she has to think about an idea, choose an idea, and it just goes really slow. So we got these questions out of her. And then uh, should I try and like sports? <laughs> it turns out she was having a lot of challenges with friends that we didn't actually know about. Um, and so this was a question that came up. And then around attention, she's like, I don't have a problem with attention. Okay, well, if it's boring, then I have a problem with attention. And she got very, very specific about her attention problems. So I said, okay, so how do I remember boring things? That will be a good question. Um, and we wrote all of this stuff down because later on we can come back to it. She might not remember our exact conversation, but we can come back to it. And having written it down, her parents can also come back to it. 
and Alex. Oh, Alex. We, through my interviews with Alex, because he came up with that statement, I was just really, really listening to any of the interviews or conversations we had and just noticing how he interacted with the testing materials. So, you know, I was like, you're moving around a lot. Like, I wonder if that's helpful to you. And he's like, he's like, yeah, I move around a lot. Ooh, that would be a good question. Why do I move around when I'm idle? Why do I kick my feet? <laughs> okay. He said, I get in trouble for kicking my feet when I'm watching TV. Okay. Yeah, that sounds like a good question. Um, and they said, you know, uh, your teacher said that you're actually getting better at raising your hand in class. Is that something you're aware of that you've been working on? He said, yeah, I'm a lot better behavior now, but not all the time. I know all the rules now, but I still can't follow them. So um, we came up with, why am I sometimes good behavior and sometimes not? Uh, he described himself as very spontaneous. I was like, oh, that sounds like a fun question. Um, and then I was laughing, I was laughing so much at him. <laughs> and he's like, most people don't find my jokes that funny, Dr. Liz. I was like, oh, you know what? Why don't we ask that question too? Because in my mind, I knew that the pragmatic piece was a question for um, parents. And this um, seemed like a really nice way to ask about the social piece and the pragmatic piece. So um, there is a handout in your, um, on the, the brainbuildingbook.com slash NAS page um, that has all these different questions that I like to ask with a few more that we didn't talk about today and some tips for uh, how to integrate those. So maybe this is the nugget that you take um, and integrate into your assessment process, how to give kids the language for getting their own question that they wanna ask. So the last piece is really this getting up on the observation deck concept from therapeutic assessment. And I think of it as like a collaborative reflection. We're, we're reflecting on the kids' behaviors and their responses and their experience of the different testing materials together and checking, and I'm checking my observations with the kid to make sure that I'm really understanding their experience, their lived experience. So I'm inviting them to share their experience, asking for their reflections. I'm sharing my own observations and I'm documenting our shared analysis. And this is actually gonna go into my report because the more that I can use the kids' language, the better the parents are gonna understand their experience. And this has been just so, so powerful. So let me show you what I mean. So when we're doing the testing, um, you're, I'm, we're still doing a standardized um, administration. So we're not going to stop in the middle and ask these questions. But as soon as a subtest is done or a group of tests, like you finish the WISP, you finish the DOS, just a very simple question. What was that like for you? And if you take anything away from this, this presentation today, just asking this question to kids throughout your assessment. What was that like for you? Was that fun? Was that easy? Was that frustrating? Was it hard? And to get their response and you'd be surprised what they actually really liked or what was super boring um, or kind of what comes out of that. Just having that question there. When you notice that a kid really likes something, what made that fun? Or even more important, when you find yourself just like, come on, kid, we just got to get through this. I just got to give you one more writing test. Or you just got to read one more passage. Taking this, a couple seconds just to say, okay, we got through it. High five. High five. But man, that seemed really challenging. What's up? And um, asking that question, like, let's unpack that a bit. We're not, we're all done. We don't have to do anymore. I'd really like to know what made that so challenging. Is it something specific about today and here? Is it something about the task? Does that remind you of anything from school or home that we can connect it to? And what do you actually do when this happens in real life? Because that's going to help me with my recommendations. If you tell me something you do that works, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it in the report and I'm going to share it because your insights are really, really important. 
kid. <laughs> and often they have really good ideas. Um, uh, I like, um, especially I do this a lot after the ramble or a, like a, a memory battery, um, because there's so many different types of tests kind of in the same theme that we give. So which of those was hardest, which was easiest. And then why do you think that is? And by the way, I don't tell them if they're right or wrong. So sometimes kids will do really, really well on the verbal learning task, um, you know, like list memory, and they'll do okay on the stories. And I'll ask them which was hardest, which was easiest. And they'll be like, that list was really, really hard. And so probing further, like, okay, what made it hard? Because sometimes what I'll find is that they expected of themselves to remember all 16 words and they got 14 out of 16 on the first round. Um, and so their score is off the charts, but their experience of it is I wasn't perfect. And I can log that information to see if it helps us connect with anything else. Are there other things that kind of link to their um, reaction on that test? So it's giving me a lot of information. Did you use any strategies on that task? Um, anything that would have made it easier? Or I thought I noticed, tell me if you agree, disagree, or if you would say it differently. So this might be like, I thought I noticed you talking yourself through the, that picture memory task. Am I right? Um, can you tell me more about that? Is that a strategy that you use? Or I thought I noticed that you like really perked up when we did the reading task, but you just, um, like when I, when I had you copy all those designs, I just kind of noticed that your energy fell. Like, are you, is that, uh, is that correct? Would you agree that was something that, that uh, kind of sapped your energy <laughs> when you had to draw? Um, so for Caleb, this was really, really important to illustrate this. So um, Caleb and his parents were actually on the same page um, for questions. So Caleb's parents' questions, how do we help with, him with spontaneous behaviors that annoy classmates? Uh, how can he better recognize what triggers his frustration? What learning supports does he need? And why is writing hard? So Caleb is autistic. We knew that before coming in. He was coming in for a, a triennial um, and part of it was that parents really wanted him to start to understand uh, what autism meant for him. Um, and there, um, academically, he was really struggling with writing. And Caleb didn't have any questions about writing, but he wanted to know, what do I do when other kids are mean? And how do I prevent anger outbursts? So first of all, just focusing on his questions, we um, are seeing that the emotional piece is most important to him. And that's going to take precedence in um, how we talk to him over why writing is hard, because honestly, he doesn't care. He wants to know how he can get along, um, you know, like what to do with the bullying that's happening. And he is really working hard on his um, managing anger. Um, so here are all our questions that we have. And I gave uh, Caleb the FA expository writing which is a, an essay, a short essay. And he put his head down on the table and pushed the book away. And we were having just like a great rapport before that, having a good time, and he just completely shut down. He refused to do it. <laughs> so the, the question that I have for you here is, what was this assessing? This is a writing task. What information do we actually get out of this? And he refused to do it. I think a few years ago, I would have thought, okay, spoiled subtest, let's try something else, or let's take a break and then put some rewards on the table so that he can be motivated to do this writing task. Um, but I did something different. What I did is I took the booklet away and I said, okay, it looks like something happened here. I don't know what it is, but let's take a break. We went and we played Uno for a bit, came back to the table, he was communicating again. And I said, okay, I took the, the booklet back out and I didn't give it to him. I kept it, but I just had it in view. And I said, listen, I'm not saying we have to do this or we don't have to do this. This is a, a Ross Green technique. I'm not saying we have to, or we don't have to. Um, but I wanna understand what happened. So I noticed you had a really difficult time when I brought this out, what's up? 
Um, and as we talked, he said, sometimes when my energy gets low, my brain goes into power outage. Said, oh, so did you have a power outage? Yes, I had a power outage. That is so good to know. Okay, you are overwhelmed. And then he adds, that way I don't get angry. And I really was just so touched by this because it was something that I would not have picked up on. He put his head down on the table. He shut down because he was starting to feel so frustrated and he was going to have an anger outburst. And if you remember, his question is, how do I control my anger outburst? So this is his strategy, shutting down and stopping communicating with me um, was, was actually his was, was actually a sign that he was starting to get very angry and was part of his strategy of, of dealing with that anger. Oh, this is so, so helpful, Caleb. Um, what helps you when you have a power outage? Because now I know his words, power outage. Okay, so tell me what, what's helpful when you have a power outage. He said, it helps to take a break, but I don't know how to come back. And he's looking at the booklet. He's like, I know you want me to do that, but I don't know how to get back. They said, okay, well, if you're game, here's our process approach. Let's run some experiments. Let's think about some things that would, would help. And again, I'm not saying you have to, or you don't have to, but let's play around with it a little bit. He said, okay. So he said that resting his head on the table can actually be helpful. So what he had done before was, was helpful. Um, I said that like, sometimes it can be helpful for kids to know what to predict. So should I tell you a little bit more about the test, how many items, kind of what we're doing, um, give you a little bit more about the expectations? And he said, um, he said, yeah, that will, that will help. So I gave him a little bit more. And again, this is a break from standardization, obviously. So I'm going to be documenting all of this in my report, kind of how I um, just shifted, you know, changed up the, the test and the instructions a little bit to help him access it. Um, I, uh, he said, sometimes it helps me with a fidget. I was like, great, what do you want? Here's a squish ball. And he's like, actually, can I have the, the foam pieces that we from the ADOS the day before? And so we got out the foam pieces and he, he um, just used the foam pieces as a fidget. I was like, okay, that could, that could work. And then I said, I noticed that you um, have hummed to yourself through some of our activities and that seems to help you. And he's like, yeah, but I can't do that in class. Um, I was like, well, let's, let's just try it. Let's just run an experiment and see if that helps you. And so with all of these things in place, I think it was also on the bouncy ball in my office, he took the booklet and he wrote the paragraph. And it was a great paragraph. So now what did we learn from the FAR <laughs> expository writing test? We learned a lot about how Caleb can self-regulate. And he's the one who told me about it. Not me going off and coming up with my genius adult ideas about and theories about what's going to be helpful for him. He came up with it. So again, you have a handout with a lot of these questions that hopefully will help you to um, uh, integrate some of these into uh, your testing practice when you're transitioning from one set of materials to another um, or um, just in those those kind of down times while you're playing Uno. Um, these are great questions to ask. Okay, part three of this model is no surprises. So now we've talked to kids about the purpose of the assessment. We've gotten a lot of their highways. We've talked about some of those things that are hard and we're documenting those under construction zones, highways, throughout the assessment. Um, and this is a, a summary sheet that you can actually use. Sometimes I use this for note taking um, during my assessment, um, or I definitely use this as a way, like a summary sheet um, that I put as a face sheet on the report. Um, but it helps me to organize the information in really simple ways because uh, it has to fit in that box that it's going to be kid-friendly language. Of course, we also have the brain building books, which are awesome, awesome tools for documenting this. So when you go back through it, kids are reminded of the conversations that we had. It's going to be no big reveal. We're making sure we're focused on their questions. We're using their words. 
so that we can define their eligibility or their diagnosis or their neurodivergence in words that make sense to them. And we're going to make this plan together. So for Alex, what that looked like, he was like really loved the puzzle and patterns task. He has a great vocabulary. He was like, yeah, I heard that before. <laughs> um, and he was um, just kind of reframing that I get in trouble for calling out as like, your teachers are really recognizing you're an eager participant, you're an eager learner. And I really wanna acknowledge that. He's becoming more self-aware and he really wants to learn and improve. We also noticed in some of those reflection questions that he remembers small chunks of information best, which is going to be important because that's a recommendation that's in his um, profile. Um, and we're going to work on spontaneous behavior and sitting for a long time. Also joke timing and focusing on boring things. And if you notice, now we have a really nice ADHD profile here, which is going to make sense to him. Because we can say, so guess what, Alex? In our work together, we learned that your brain is built in a way that makes puzzles and patterns, vocabulary, and spontaneous behavior come really easily. Um, we also learned that um, sitting for a long time, um, that uh, or <laughs> controlling when that spontaneous behavior happens, um, and joke timing can be much more difficult. And it turns out you are not alone. This pattern happens a lot, so often, in fact, that we have a name for it, and it's called ADHD. That's what ADHD means. And now that we know, our job is to maximize your highways and find tools to help you with your construction zones. So for Alex, it sounds like this. For you, ADHD means your brain is built in a way that makes puzzles and patterns, vocabulary, participating come easily. It also can be hard to focus on things you don't like, time your jokes, or sit still in class. He's like, oh, that's what ADHD means. So he took his book to his IEP meeting. This is his first time attending a meeting like this. And I asked him, what's most important for your teachers to know? And he said, I want you to know that my jokes take off, but they don't always land. And I just was really impressed with Alex. And just this is just such a succinct way to gain that empathy from teachers. Like, okay, here's a kid who's really trying. He just is still under construction. Same thing for Jo, looking at her strengths and her challenges became, uh, she ended up with a diagnosis of a learning disability in writing. Um, so we use the fancy term dysgraphia. And for her, it means that her brain is, um, has a ton of awesome ideas, but it can be hard to choose just one and write it down. And she kind of reflected, well, you know, I do like the ideas part of writing to which her mom's jaw just dropped to the floor because she had never heard one positive word about writing from this girl ever in her life. Um, and then for Caleb, we um, talked about, we integrated that language of power outages. For you, autism means your brain is built in a way that sees the world differently. This difference gives you your creativity in your engineer's mind, which was language from that the family uses to talk about um, his strengths a lot. And it also means you feel things more intensely than others, which can lead to power outages. So using that language to define the challenging part. And he's like, yep, that's me. Um, and I actually, I did this evaluation at the end of the school year. And so we didn't actually end up meeting with the team until maybe October the next year. Um, and um, I went in to meet with the team and I was like, I really want to explain to you this language and metaphors. And the teacher was like, I, I already know. I read your report and Caleb uses that language. Um, and he actually told me at the beginning of the year at our first writing assignment that it's helpful for him to hum to himself during writing time. Um, otherwise he gets too frustrated. And so I just gave the other kids at the table noise canceling headphones because we all are part of a community and we all need to understand what's most helpful for each other. So um, Caleb, <laughs> Caleb actually by, by October, he had stopped that, that question about like making um, noises that annoy classmates. Um, that was no longer a question because the teacher had gave him the, given him the space to do what he needed to do, normalized it for the class, and everybody in the class was able to talk about what they needed to learn at their best. And this was one of Caleb's things. It was beautiful. All right. 
Other helpful words, sometimes they're not a diagnostic term. Sometimes um, uh, the diagnostic terms are not ones that we want to use with our kids. And so a lot of times they'll talk about like, this is called difficulty with organization or we're working on time management. Motivation is a skill. It's not just something you kind of call up like a magical spell. And so we're gonna build that. For kids who struggle with emotional regulation, sometimes we'll talk about managing big feelings. Lots of people who, who feel things really deeply um, can have uh, difficulty managing those feelings. And so that's the construction project we're working on. Um, gear shifting is another good one for kids who uh, struggle with rigidity um, or explosive behaviors that can be really hard. Um, the gear shifter in your brain can get stuck sometimes. Um, uh, sensory processing, processing time, or just using the term neurodiversity. All our brains are different in important ways. Um, and so this is how your brain works differently. So um, now you have for your kid, you have highways, you have construction zones, and you can put them together. So give this a try, go ahead, pause the video, use these um, frames as a way to create a personalized um, definition of what's going on for your kid. So it could be a definition of a diagnosis. So for you, if you have a, a defined diagnosis, this means your brain is built in a way that makes your highways come easily and your construction zones more difficult and fill in their highways and construction zones. Or if there's not a specific term or you don't want to use it, parents aren't ready yet, um, uh, or this is, you're just not sure and you wanna kind of test the waters. Using the term neurodiversity is so important for all of our kids or for kids who don't have a diagnosis or, or not, um, who don't qualify um, and are not gonna be needing services. We still learned a lot about their brain. So we can talk about neurodiversity. This means all our brains are different in important and necessary ways. So for you, that looks like your brain works best when your highways when um, uh, you can uh, see things and touch them and has more difficulty when it's all auditory. Um, I put together a document with a lot of the um, kind of ways that we've defined different common diagnoses for kids using kid-friendly language. So this is a resource on the brainbuildingbook.com slash NASP page that you can access to get some ideas for what this might look like for your, your child. Um, this is also a handout if you do have a chance to sit down with a child for a longer period of time to really talk through. Um, this is a handout that kind of kind of walk you through the agenda. So um, the fourth piece of our model is continued conversation. And basically, no matter how magical that moment is with a kid where you're telling them about their brain, um, it's, it's not, it's not going to stick <laughs> unless we make sure that the other adults in their life have the same language and that this conversation is ongoing. We don't learn in one, you know, bit. Um, and so we have a lot of tools that are going to help um, document this conversation so that kids can revisit it with the adults in their life. Understanding the journey, it's not a single event, but all we have is a single event. So whether it's using uh, this assessment summary sheet to make sure that whatever you talked about with the kid is going to teachers and parents in a really consumable way, whether it's the brain image and you can download these two separate from the books and just use this to write in what you're learning as you're learning it. And this is something that um, when I first started doing this, it was just a brain image and kids still have it you know, on their bedroom wall from when we did assessment years ago. Um, and of course the brain building books are, is actually a physical book you take home with you that has documented all of this. Um, we're making sure everyone has that same language and we're encouraging self-advocacy. And for kids who are just starting out, it might just be handing the book to a, a teacher and saying, here, this is what we learned <laughs> and read it together. And it's also making sure that they know that they are not alone. Um, I mean, neurodiversity is a fact, not a theory. It is a fact of how our, our world works and people who think differently have made our world a better place. And so 
you and your different brain are part of a vibrant and welcoming community, whether your neurodivergence has a name or not. Um, there are a lot of awesome videos that talk about these differences um, and including, you know, kids who might um, fit a profile of ADHD, autism, dyslexia, kids who have trouble with emotional regulation, um, so teaching them about the hand model, or just what is neurodiversity. This is a great video um, by Tamara Souls. Um, and I'll go ahead and play it so you can kind of see what it would be like to show this to a kid. What is neurodiversity? We all have unique brains that make each of us special with our own things that we are great at, like noticing small details others don't see and some things that are harder for us like calming ourselves when we get excited, mad, or worried. Neurodiversity celebrates all of those differences. We need all kinds of brains to make this world a better place. Some people are more alike than others. Some differences in thinking have been given names, like ADHD, autism, dyslexia, dyspraxia, Tourette's, and others. While they bring some challenges, they also bring important gifts. Neurodiversity makes the world beautiful. We all need to help each other and celebrate each of our strengths. Together, we will reach new heights and everyone can soar. So I love that video um, as kind of a, a starter for kids or for kids who are a little more kind of amorphous in their diagnosis. Um, and sometimes they might ask things like, like, oh, do I have ADHD? And we can say, you know, like, it's not always so clear cut. And you might find you have a lot of things that are in common with other people with ADHD, but you don't meet criteria. There's, um, you know, different criteria that we have or like it seems like your brain might have some things in common with ADHD brains but not all not all of the things that would give you that particular label right now or um uh, we can um use it to start a conversation um with kids and uh, for some parents who are having like a harder time um with their own feelings about sharing different things with kids that can be a nice video just to get the neurodiversity language into their vocabulary as a family. Um, but as I said, there's lots of videos and I am collecting them all the time. This is a spreadsheet that has all the ones that um, I have found really helpful for different kids. And you'll see that there's kind of the general neurodiversity, ADHD, autism, dyslexia, emotional difficulties. There's videos for uh, on giftedness, OCD, uh, Tourette's, epilepsy, and so forth. Um, and the most important piece of continuing the conversation is really documenting the journey. So asking kids to document um, and or you writing it down, um, whether it's through these brain maps that you can evolve over time or using just a summary, which is something that I love as a teacher or parent IEP handout because handing out the report can be really overwhelming, especially for parents and their emotional experience of the IEP meeting matters. Um, it's great to throw up on a screen if you're doing Zoom meetings because it's much more accessible than, than our reports. Um, just as a cover sheet or for older students who like the brain map or the, the brain building books might be a little too kitschy. Um, the um, having this can be really helpful. Um, I use it a lot for my older high school students um, who might be juniors or seniors. Um, on the other end, for kids who have developmental and language delays um, and who might not be able to access the more abstract metaphors, um, our colleagues in Australia uh, developed this three box worksheet, which follows the same kind of structure. My strengths, my le brain learns best when, which is, was how they covered the challenges. Like, what do I need to learn best? And then how my teacher can help me, which is the recommendations or tools. Um, 
and kids get to decorate these. And it's, it's a way to give closure and appreciation to kids for their work, because no matter their level of understanding, we still, we still owe kids the respect of that like, you were the most important part of this. Like you did all of the work and now the adults are going to go talk about you. And so how do we make sure that the narrative that kids are writing about their experience is positive? I did something really important. Even if they don't understand yet what that is, we're starting that narrative of this is important. It's teaching me about myself. It's helping the adults help me more. And I'm really important here. And so having something, and there's um, actually in the, um, on the blog section, you'll see um, a, uh, feedback and intellectual disability. And there's a couple of different ideas of how to do this with kids who have lower cognitive and language levels. Um, as I mentioned, of course, the brain building books are super good tools for this. So if you're interested in those, feel free to um, check them out. Ask me any questions. Um, on brainbuildingbook.com. There is a version for elementary school students. Um, it just has really vibrant images and the, the images tell the story themselves and are often just like really uh, great ways to um, get that growth mindset language there. And so many parents that I've worked with say that this book is way more impactful than my report. And I write a good report, <laughs> but they say, you know, I kind of got it, but as soon as I got this book, now I understand my kids' profile. Uh, we have one for older kids as well. I use this with middle school up through high school. Um, and it's the same metaphor. It's just the language is a little more sophisticated. The drawings are a little more um, sophisticated uh, and comic book like uh, to invite um, more participation from kids. So please feel free to reach out if you have any questions. If you attended NAS, you are welcome to use the NAS discount code for any of the materials on the brainbuildingbook.com website. Um, and it's just been such an honor to be able to present at NAS this year. Thank you so much for your amazing work with kids. And I um, hope that I have a chance to meet and talk with you all at some point during the conference. Take care.